This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Why are you getting boxes of Kleenex? And who is Wonderface? <laughs> Wonderface? Yeah. Uh... Welcome back. This is part two of episode two of the Bonfire Fables, and we're going to be getting into the majority of our listener questions. So to start us off, it kind of ties into our last one, uh, where we're talking about other characters and other moments in the show. Uh, this one's from Ethan the Renegade on Tumblr. In every D&D campaign, there are highly emotional moments that stick with you. What was your favorite emotionally charged moment that didn't involve your character? Uh, I will say, because I wasn't even in the campaign yet, the resurrection was, like, a fun... I mean, everybody was clearly, I don't know, emotionally charged, because they didn't know whether or not these characters that you had spent several months developing (laughs) were even going to make it past, like, the second official chapter. But it was a really interesting way to just see how it all shook out and really establish certain relationships between characters that let that backstory develop without the listeners being able to hear that portion of the adventure, that coming into it late was kind of helpful for me to figure out who everybody was. I want to say, too, with that, touching off of that, um, I don't think we ever talked about it in-game. It wasn't really specified, but Michael's mentioned it before. Is Calvin's um, offering to Vesper in that. He used his last hit point, and the only reason he kept standing was because of orcish endurance or whatever that's called. So when he says, you know, my life for yours, he literally took the last of his health and and gave it to her. And that was very sweet. That was, yeah. But we never, I don't think we ever touched on that, so. I advertise the podcast to my friends by telling them, if you listen to episodes two and three, you get to hear me cry. And I get questions like, wait, real crying or like acting crying both it's fun nothing like playing a game that emotionally scars you yay fun if catharsis was good enough for the greeks it's good enough for us right i have i have one and i don't know why it sticks with me but uh the one that that always pops in my head when i think about things like this is uh Vesper and Calvin's fight in episode, I think it was 12, 11, uh, they got really heated, they were yelling at each other, and then Wink comes in and lays down the law and uh, gets them to stop. And I think the reason why it sticks with me, maybe I'm just pulling this out of my ass, I'm not sure, but I feel like it was a very pivotal moment for both of them um, in growing up as characters. But uh, it was just a lot of character growth in that moment that, I don't know, it just sticks with me. Yeah, I really wanted Wink, because I knew I was retiring Wink after that episode. And I was like, I really want him to make this point to these people and also kind of be, like give him an excuse of, like, I can't stick around with you children anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that was definitely a turning point for Vesper, because that was when she realized, okay, I was also at fault. <laughs> quite, you know, significantly in that, and a lot of her frustrations and anger she wasn't talking about. Um, and there's a lot of, with Vesper's emotional state, it's interesting because she's a genasi, and she's air and fire, and in the player handbook it really describes how flighty and how quick both of those elements switch between, you know, they don't feel anything lightly, they're very much like, one moment they're joyously happy, and the next they're very somber, and like, quick to anger and then they're fine and so it's interesting finding a balance of that personality that she definitely does have and vesper's insistence that no of course i don't feel things i'm very much in control of everything 
and she's not. <laughs> and that was the first moment that I think she really lost her control. So that was an interesting one. That was definitely a pivotal moment for her, yeah. I liked when after you know, went to the see where am I, you know, came back and it went to find Orcesis because you all had been, and when you actually came, went there, spoiler alert for whatever episode that is, um, but you went back and found them and you all been beat down mentally and physically over the past number of sessions as players and as characters going into a very dangerous area at a low level. Um, and then coming back and facing him as an enemy and as a friend and surviving was a big turning point for your characters, or I felt it was, both because of Orcesis had to pass and y'all had to do kind of grow up and be the ones that did it. So I think that was a big turning point. It kind of brought us into that next chapter. And, and I, what, I feel uh, like oh, go ahead. that was a moment that kind of brought the group back together again because it felt like through the previous arc we had kind of been fracturing in some ways more subtle and in some ways much more dramatic but coming back to that thing that had created us as a group in our childhood and dealing with the consequences that we had not been able to deal with at the time this as, as Klaus points out the the moments the the adventure that we had named ourselves after that is what really made the bronze scales the bronze scales and i was just going to say that i love that calvin was the one that ended it especially i didn't realize that calvin was the one that had the most history with orcesis too and that it was all very i don't know wrapped up in a moment it was very nice it's hard to say not involved with because i mean we were all there for this but it was another character's moment. The first that always comes to my mind is Ellery's uh, moment on the boat where she opens up about what happened in prison. And that was such a great moment because, as we've mentioned, you know, our chat is always full of us making dick jokes and being ridiculous. And so we were doing that as she started talking, even though I had known where it was going because I was absent the session that she thought she was going to tell the story. And so she just sent me what, what it was. And so I knew where it was going, but we were all, you know, making jokes in the chat. And as soon as Ellery really started getting into that, we all went dead silent, both on our mics and in the chat. And we all just sat and listened to our friend pouring out this experience. And it was really, really powerful. That silence was terrifying. <laughs> it's like it was it was hard to tell, like, if it was silence because everybody was really paying attention or if it was silence because I was like overdoing it or or no, what so I, at least from my side it was just like it, we were enraptured because it was so it really was such a powerful like thing and especially for Ellery of all people to open up like that and to reveal what's causing her pain that's it's a very it's strong and it was a good moment and today I think the only time the chat has gone silent <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we've gone through a lot of other crazy <laughs> emotional shit, and everyone's still been basically yeah. shitposting in chat, so. <laughs> Michael? That's my name. I have no idea, uh, to be honest. Michael doesn't do emotions. I'm not really good at that <laughs> aspect of things. I'm just kind of here for the goofs. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that, I mean, we've done, there's, just going straight off of Ellery's thing, that's, uh, there's a lot of serious stuff, and especially to keep in my dumbass Calvin mentality, it's really hard to, to let any of that shit sink in and not just be real and then to turn around and, and be Calvin. Uh, so, I don't know, uh, what really hit me or what really stands out, there's a lot of moments, uh, I really like, I mean, I think, I think probably the one that sticks out to me right this second is cause, probably because it's more recent. And, uh, Swan brought it up earlier, um, referencing, uh, balls. Was it, was it, I don't remember who said it. Somebody said something about ball, you know, being willing to let maybe with, I don't, Ellery, I don't, or anyway, uh, 
words are so difficult. How do you guys do this? Uh, I was just talking to him. Not well. Clearly, I'm not getting the letter. What, was it when I was talking about how Ball is willing to give everyone the benefit of the doubt and wow. see the good in everybody I else? From, I went from, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. That was <laughs> way the wrong. Yes, yeah, that all, is exactly it. Um, specifically, the, the way in which he was uh, with the witch. And how he was just so willing to, like, no, that's, this is so and so, and I don't remember her name, but just so willing to be, like, let's go along with it. And I don't know, he's just really good at pulling off that, the real emotion without really, really conveying it. Like, every word he says has weight. And I find that very compelling. I do want to jump off one thing that Michael said that he's just here for the goofs. You're brilliant at it, but the moments where Calvin gets serious, I always feel like, oh shit, yes. Dad's here. Like it's yeah, <laughs> when Calvin is like, no, y'all fucked up. It's like, oh, if that idiot realized it, we done fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I try to avoid those as much as possible. There haven't been many, but when they because of that, when they do happen, it's like, oh yeah, guys, even Calvin can see that this was bad. <laughs> Speaking of Calvin, though, one one of my favorite moments was a Calvin moment, and that was when right before he took his oath, when he was talking to the High Beacon about it, and talking about his uh like his purpose, and saying that he was willing to give his life for his friends, and the High Beacon asks him if his friends are willing to do the same for him. And he says that he doesn't know, but that doesn't matter that he would do it anyway. That moment, I just loved so much. That's funny, because that was, in my mind, like, a subtle dig at all y'all, if you want some more. No, 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 I get that, but it's still, I I love Calvin. He's such a good egg. Because it said, I mean, yeah, it was a dig at the rest of us, but it also said volumes about who Calvin is. And that's that's uh, also weird because I totally did not want to do any of that. In like, I was actually gonna to, to write to to Klaus and and say, hey, can we do all the the oath stuff like out of game and just say like it? Oh, hey, it happened, and and not actually play any of that out. But I guess it's good that it did. We're doing a podcast. You're not allowed to do anything off screen. That's <laughs> where I want to live. Off screen and jumping in to make dick jokes. Yeah. <laughs> but tying into this, you know, thing about like emotionally charged moments and then our earlier discussion about like safe spaces with these group. I talked about it on, on Twitter when I'm getting emotional. After episode 36 came out, which was Vesper's fall. And, uh, God, fucking damn it. Um, <laughs> Quick, someone make a dick joke. <laughs> penises, um, penises, lollipop. Oh my god, why? What is that? God, we have to get that as a ringtone. Anyways, that I just was able to be a very dramatic in that um episode and have this like hysterical breakdown where I'm saying a lot of things that didn't make a ton of sense and that were just these fractures of thoughts that Vesper is having at that moment and had had previously that I was able to get to that emotional place and be able to convey that. It's just, it speaks volumes of like how much I trust you guys and I love you guys and how, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, just how much of a safe space we've made here. And I went on a small rant on Twitter about it, but just, it's really cathartic to get to those emotional moments. I know I'm really bad in real life at being emotional and being sincere. So even when I'm kind of sappy with you guys, like I'm, I'm actually very bad at um, sincerity so to be able to express pain and to express grief through a character is very helpful for me and so i just want to say thank you guys i guess for being a, a wonderful group to be able to explore those more emotionally charged moments with we have a lot of really beautiful moments in, in our game and i'm just glad that we have a beautiful world to explore them in uh, which ties into our next question, also from Ethan. Um, this one's specifically for you, Klaus. How long did you spend working on the world setting? I started about three-ish years. About three-ish years. My Google Doc is like 250 pages. 
I used to write it like a lot of paragraph, and now it's just bullet notes. Because I can't read paragraphs in session, but bullet points have enough for me to go off of. But going off of that, I initially just built sort of ground up. So I just made a village, and I didn't know anything about the world. And then I made another city, and it started growing that way. And at some point along the line, maybe a year in, I was like, I got to figure this stuff out because I have no idea where I am. So I went through and did some initial building with creation myths, gods, history, stuff like that. Made a calendar and got a basic skeleton set up. And then I want to use, Dale had the perfect term. She did a video on this and the term was discovery. And that is the perfect term to where I'm at now because I have a vague idea about everything. And I have some very specific details for a lot of places, but discovery works as such a great word because if we suddenly changed our perspective and zoomed in on another place, I have a vague idea of what happened. And when we zoom over there, it's like the fog of war gets lifted and suddenly I'm discovering what that session is. I used to think that if you were building your world during session, I was like, you're just making it up. But then I thought, you know, that's basically what I'm doing when I'm at home. But when I'm doing it in session, I'm doing it in front of the players. So now that I have that basic skeleton set up, I'm able to discover what the world is based off the campaigns I've run in the past, based on your current story arcs, the current characters, the other NPCs that are sort of in the, in the run, any of the history books I've read or any fantasy, any sort of anything I consume kind of gets turned into that. So three years, and I'm just now feeling like I'm starting to figure out how to do it. I am so pleased that you liked my use of the word discovery. That because, word is perfect. Because there was so much confusion about me saying that. No one had any idea what I was talking about. But it's, it's what you said. that I couldn't use a different word because I felt like it wasn't building, it wasn't creating, it wasn't it, – it was, it was discovering, and I had no other word to use. So that's, it's made it all worthwhile. Oh, it's such a perfect word because it's this weird double think where you're making it up, but it it feels as if it was there all along. It was always that way and it had to be that way. You just didn't know it yet. And so that's why yeah. it feels like discovery is such a perfect word. You get it, man. You get it. I get it. I get it. I mean, I also have to say, I, I talked a little bit before about Klaus being just brilliant. He's such a good DM, you guys. I can't express how good he is. But also, like... When I said, oh, I'm thinking about making an elf barbarian, I got like three different documents that were like, all right, well, let me explain the history of elf culture, the geography of this area, the different factions and the way that they interact with each other. It was like all the information right here. It was just incredible. And it was so much fun to read through. Uh, I'm glad I I have you enjoyed a, it because I was worried that it would be just like overkill, just like too much info. Now nah, nah, it's perfect. So I have kind of a follow up question for Klaus. Before becoming a DM, did you uh, ever like try writing a novel or short stories or anything like that, or is this your first your first venture into world building? No, I never really wrote. I mean, besides like papers for school, no, I never really wrote or world build or anything like that. So. Oh, shit. I'm, did know what I was doing for a long time, and I still don't, but I'm figuring it out. You absolutely should, though. So, wait, I have a question for Dale. Do you have one major setting that you use, and if so, how long have you worked on that one? Um, I guess I do, uh, because I'm only running one campaign, uh, so I never really intended. It, it was, again, I was like, I'm just going to make a village, and that'll be fine. But it did not work out that way. Because I, I guess the problem began because one of my players is a huge geography nerd and she loves maps and she wanted a map. And I said, okay, well, I don't want to give you a map that just tells you everything. So let's work out more about your character backstory and I'll give you a map that tells you what you would know. And then all the other players found out about it. And so I ended up making maps for everyone that were the same map, but with different information. Um, and so some of them, like, uh, my ranger and my, bar and my barbarian both have, like, the broadest idea of what the continent is like and where things are, but the ranger studied in, um, a keep. So her, her information is more detailed, but outdated 
where the barbarian has more accurate kind of geographical information but has less of the like place names and stuff. Um, and then as it kind of went, I ended up just building this whole world because I kind of had to. Um, and then I will have conversations with people and it's, it's exactly like you said, there's stuff that I didn't know until suddenly I knew it and it had always been true. I mean, the best example is, hey, ooh, spoilers, uh, I'm going to have to warn my players not to listen to this. But like, for example, I, I knew that there was only one thing keeping the whole place from like collapsing into war and that's the High King. And I was like, okay, so then what the High King doing is keeping everyone in, in check. And I was like, probably nothing. He's probably just a symbol. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the king has been dead for years. And it's just one of those things where you go, oh, yeah, the king actually is dead this whole time. And it's just been a whole series of, like, spies trying to make everyone believe that he's still alive so that war doesn't break out. It's just one of those things that you go, oh, yeah, I knew that the whole time. It was just buried somewhere in non-existence. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, Yeah, so I guess I do have just one setting just because... That kind of happened by accident. And if I was to start another campaign, I probably would start it in the same setting because there's so much that this campaign group won't discover and knowing that hurts me because I have all the secrets. Oh, my God. That's my pain. I start a campaign in another continent and then they ignore it. They ignore the continent. (laughs) And they go back to the old one. Uh, Don't worry. We'll go back to that continent and purge it with fire. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty much. That's, That's one of the reasons I was fire. like, let's play. I remember when we were coming up with where we wanted to start this one, I was very much like, can we play in Severwind? Because my last character for the first Northville game, which took place predominantly, I guess, in Western, um, yeah. I hadn't been a part of like any of that. I literally came in while we were on a boat going back to Western. We were there for a week, and then a dragon destroyed the city. So I was like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I had no connection to places, but I had... Klaus had asked me what cities my character was from. And I was like, I don't know. She's from this tiny town called, and I literally went on Fantasy Name Generator and went, Ashmeyer. Um, but when her parents died, she was moved to an orphanage in Refreshes Generator, Embershore. <laughs> and um, so we went then to this next campaign. I was like, well, we never really got to explore Severwind, which was this, you described it as this very wild continent, this very like frontier-like American wilderness. Frontier with yeah. Brothers Grimm twist. So I was like, and I loved the moment we did go to Severwind for a short while. We went to Embershore. We went to the Unhallowed of Wicked Hill, which is um, Calvin's order and was also Ravenwick's order. And um, we went there and just the brief glimpse that we got of those forests and the the visuals of like the tree with the noose and the raven perched in the branches and all of this like very grim but beautiful scenery. I was like, can we explore that? So I remember kind of everyone was like, oh, it doesn't really matter. And I'm like, Yes, it does. And let's start here. So I'm really glad that we're exploring more of the world. And I like that we're in the INL now because we didn't really do much of that either. Well, we kind of sped through that last time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, we had shock that would let us teleport everywhere, so we didn't really need to hang around in any place. Oh, you know, I was... Exploration is such a fun part of the game that gets overlooked all the time. I feel like the aspect of the the pilgrimage in this one that we are kind of just wandering and we have, we know where we have to end up, but it's kind of like every place we stop, do we want to get involved here or are they too racist? Yeah. (laughs) The journey is really fun because I was like, (laughs) and I'm kind of glad we came to this. And I just remember, and I'm glad that everyone was on board with it because I was after episode two that I I was, I think we were about to record episode three, which is the resurrection. I didn't know if Vesper's coming back or not. And I remember waking up and laying in bed, and I immediately grabbed my phone and messaged Klaus, and I'm like, if Vesper comes back, she's going to want to go to Nine Net. And I was really glad that everyone was like, that's a really cool idea. It helps that like almost all of y'all are associated with a holy entity yeah. of some sort. Oh, Dale, I was thinking, I was working on a city, and I couldn't remember the acronym, or I remember the acronym. I think it's sperm, but I it's can't remember sperm. what it stands for. It stands for social, political, economic, religious, and military. That's it. And it, it was just a teaching tool that we were given in ancient history, but I've carried it through life, and I hope that Kinney, my ancient history teacher from high school, is proud of me somewhere out there spreading the good word yeah, of sperm. Sperm. <laughs> oh, man. It's a really good acronym. I like it. 
it's useful. And, I, you know, I didn't realize this the last time I did the discovery stream, and I wish I had, is that I kind of use it if I'm building up a faction as well, if I need to come up with NPCs within the faction. I'm like, okay, well, we need to have some representative from each of the things. Well, maybe not from every single one, but, you know, like, it, it's a good uh, sort of scaffolding to build everything around. Next question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Klaus, this one's uh, kind of also for you, but also for Nyessa, um, from Sora Avalon. Uh, what made you decide to have Ellery's Wild Surges trigger when she casts a cantrip and when she rolls at or below her proficiency bonus? Well, I know what prompted it was when we were in Ogre's Breath Pass, and I rolled a natural one on a spell attack for the first time in quite a while, and it almost hit Calvin, but that moment, uh, I guess, triggered a realization that I hadn't really been getting wild magic surges, and we needed to figure out what system we were going to use for that to actually incorporate that. So and the the wording is it's been a while since I've read the official wording, but I think it's sort of vague and lets the DM kind of choose when they want to do it, mm -hmm. which means that I'm going to forget that a lot with eight with seven eight players. Um, so I wanted it to be something that the player could kind of track. George actually came up with a really cool one where it builds, and I like the idea of it of it building. Um, but we ended up just sticking with this as something simple that kind of grew as she leveled. It allowed her to have wild ma magic surges, but not all the time. Um, and we said, you know, we'll revisit it and see if we like it and come back to something else. We just haven't changed it. And I guess the, the cantrip thing is more with natural ones. Just it yeah. seems like a logical consequence for a critical failure. Yeah, a natural one. Still, nothing's been bad as of yet. They've all been positive yeah. or neutral. Well, well the aging part, the is list. not... Yeah. Right, but and getting shorter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The wild magic list is skewed in the player's favor. Yeah. There's a couple fairly bad ones, but overall, like most of the time, it's just something useless and weird or good for you. Mm. I remember when we were running that Taldorai campaign, and uh, our wild magic sorcerer kept getting the one that gave everybody vulnerability to piercing damage, and that was <laughs> all the party used. I was like, "Well, this fight's over." It happened <laughs> twice, and I was like, "Come on." <laughs> <laughs> I remember because it's always Roger. He always plays the wild magic sorcerer. He always plays the sorcerer, but it's usually wild magic. And I, it's our always Noel, wild magic. It's never. It's not always. But no the Noel incident sorcerer. trademark. <laughs> I mean, the Noel incident. One that, it was, was not a draconic, but. Yeah. But that one was a really interesting moment where his wild magic was the only reason we didn't TPK. Because we were in this cavern, there were gnolls everywhere, and he rolled a magic surge that basically meant every turn he was getting more hit points. And so every turn he was getting knocked down by the, the final, like, gnoll boss. And the rest of us, two of us were dead, dead, and the other two were unconscious. And, um, Sven, or no, it was, uh, Silhorn, his sorcerer, got that surge, and he had five levels of exhaustion. So if he went down again, he was dead. And he managed to kill the boss and get us out of there. And it was traumatic. And the rest of us have never gone forward without hating gnolls with a violent passion. Gnolls are the worst. I fucking hate them. Yeah, so that's why we did that. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the system that we have for the wild magic surges because it means that the chance of getting a surge will keep increasing as the levels increase. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, it's just a, it's a cool way to build on it so that it's, it's getting, there's, there's more chances for bad things to happen, but it's also going to happen more often as we're more prepared to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then so it, energy spills over. Yeah. And it kind of ties into as Ellery gets more powerful as a sorcerer, her magic and her lack of ability can, to control it in some way also gets more powerful, uh, yeah. which is a fun little thing to have to deal with. And I, I'd kind of like to mention also the way that it worked in the prologue before we started recording, because at that point we were level zero. But when Ellery's magic first started manifesting, what would happen would be anytime she got particularly emotional, especially scared, 
or or angry, but mostly when she got scared, Klaus would have me roll either a charisma saving throw or a wisdom saving throw to see if I could contain the magic that was starting to bubble up. And I thought that was a really cool way of introducing the wild magic. Uh, so Klaus, we got another one for you. Uh, it has to do with world building. <laughs> this answer might be really quick if you don't want to answer it. Uh, but it's from uh, Ma- Mage Tank Rum. Uh, what in the world is going on with them Celestials? I mean, come on now. I mean, pr- first of all, Mage Tank Rum is a great name. I love that. Uh, and you may or may not find out. Who knows? We may yeah. or may not find out. <laughs> I can Classic say that DM answer. You don't know. Ellery has a couple avenues of investigation that she wants to pursue, but we just haven't gotten to a place where that's possible quite yet. Mm-hmm. In another year or so, we'll finally hit Nymanet. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we, getting close. We you're might find close. out that you're like two thirds away. So we're getting close. Uh, next question, also from Mage Tank Rum, Ellery and Ezekiel. Are they going to end up being a true couple or just a flame? They'd really make a good power couple, if you ask me. So, Rum is one of our shippers. Oh, great. I didn't know yeah, what you <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. For me, it's a. I think we'll explore that in game. Like, I didn't. Obviously, Ezekiel's still trying to get the whole party to devolve into a cuddle pile. So, yeah. like, he's. Oh, is that what we're calling it? <laughs> uh. I will say that I think he feels closer to Ellery because they've had that kind of intimacy. It's just, especially because, I don't know, Vesper's always got to stick up her butt and, like, Ball is too innocent for wor- for the world that it's just, like, he does, he is, he appreciates that Ellery has a similar mindset. Um, so I think he feels closest to her in the party, but I don't know if this is, like, the power couple of the, the, the campaign. Um, for all I know, we're going to get to uh, the Grove, and you'll see Ezekiel, like, running around with his druid friends, <laughs> all of the other hippies, and Ellery would be like, oh, I'm out. Well, no, <laughs> Ellery would have no problem with that whatsoever. <laughs> um, but, I mean, Ellery did not go into this expecting any kind of romantic connection. That wasn't really her goal in all of this. And, um, I guess she would not think of it in these terms, but I would say that she is on the aromantic spectrum. So she may or may not be able to have romantic feelings at all, but if she, if she does, she doesn't even know how to recognize them. Yeah. So I think they're firmly in friends with benefits territory that yeah. like, they just understand each other. Maybe I'm picking up a completely different vibe than everybody else, but it's, I mean, just having been around my sisters enough, I think I have some idea that it really feels like Ellery's, like, hooked. I don't know, I don't, and I don't mean on the, the physical aspect of it, I don't know. I think she's attached. I mean, I ship them, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, she's she she is attached to Ezekiel. It, in in some manner anyway, but if that develops into something romantic or if there's any kind of spark there that she doesn't recognize yet, well, we'll just have to find out. He's really just the first guy that she didn't, like, see in diapers <laughs> that she hangs <laughs> around with. Mm-hmm. So I think at this point we can get into in-character questions, and funnily enough, they're all from at Furble Scout on Twitter. She, She's such a gem. I love her. She comes up with the best questions. So uh, for this one, for this first one, we can answer either player or character, because maybe you haven't thought of it in your character yet. But um, what is each character's most nostalgia-inducing food and why? And then she says, okay, fine, players to Winky Face. Hunter has no nostalgia. Mine is Eggs and Soldiers. <laughs> Rabbit stew. Did you say eggs and soldiers? Yeah, eggs and I never know what to call them. Eggs and soldiers is the name I hear other people call them. I actually call them dippy eggs. You know, it's when you're like, I'm two minute confused. boil an egg and you put it in a cup and then you cut up toast and then you dip the toast into the dippy egg. 
Oh. And then once you finish the egg, you turn the egg upside down and you crack the bottom with a spoon so that we just can't see all the shell out to sea and make storms. Sure. That's everyone, right? Are you doing a ritual each time you eat breakfast? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Do you not use eggshells for storms? <laughs> that's, that's incredibly very, useful. It's <laughs> an important step. For storm? Oh, my God. It's what my grandma always told us. I don't. I, and we thought that it was a thing that no one knew about until I found like a poem somewhere that sailors believed malevolent witches would sail out to sea in eggshells and conjure storms. So you have to crack the bottom of your eggshell after eating dippy eggs. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe they're uh, turtle dragon eggs that they cut in half and use a boat. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm on board. I think, well, I, I'll, I'll answer in Ellery's voice for Ellery. Well, my most nostalgic food would be, so it, it's, a, it's a festival food. And lots of people make this food. Uh, when there's festivals, people sell it. Uh, but at the copper sale, my mom would make these, different people have different names for it, but it's basically bits of fried dough with honey. And it's just really good. And I can get it pretty much anywhere when I go around at the festivals. But no one makes it the way that she does. The way that she did. So maybe someday I'll figure it out myself. Uh, and then Adam's character, Nyessa's favorite nostalgic food, is my parents' award-winning Texas chili. Uh, I can say I didn't really think about this for Ezekiel, but I imagine, um, there is probably some kind of, like, fancy dessert that he could have gotten at growing up in his, like, manor house in the city that he hasn't been able to eat in a while, and I don't think he'd ever admit to missing it, but, like, there's that one thing that is probably so complicated and fancy that he can't possibly do that now, but is also like, I want it real bad. I don't know what it is, but some, it's something. Ooh, I like this. We'll find out. Oh, damn it. <laughs> some sort of like fancy parfait or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like some ridiculous over the top thing that like obviously you can't make on a cooking fire. Takes hours to make. Yeah. Uh, I would say for Amsterdam's Noms Blossom. Uh, my mother makes a rather delightful blackberry pie, and I always love it every time I have it. And Alexander doesn't eat ever. <laughs> uh, for, for Alexander, it would be, you know, you, you've probably heard of strawberry rhubarb pie. Um, but my grandma would make, uh, raspberry rhubarb pie because she grew the raspberries and the rhubarb herself. And so that's what they had. And it, it is the greatest pie that I've ever had. You're going to mail some of that to California, right? <laughs> I've mean, uh, never actually eaten rhubarb. I haven't either. Rhubarb is terrible unless you put it is in pie. Is it a fruit or like a root? No, it's like a root thing, I think. Yeah, it's kind of, it, it, it kind of grows a lot like um, how, uh, what's it called? Like lettuce grows. It like grows in the ground and it has this big gigantic leaves and then you eat the stem part. It's also the name of a cartoon cat. <laughs> I don't I don't know that I have an answer for either I suppose for Vesper it's got to be something that is probably very simple I think it was probably something that Lysander made when she was very little before he got married and became like a house husband <laughs> um, when it was kind of just the two of them uh, so whatever he kind of would make that you know when it was just them I think is whatever and then it's hard for me because I, well, half my family's Italian and the other half is Southern. So food is a very big part of a family. Um, so there's a lot that comes to mind. I think my favorite thing, though, is probably my mom's chicken in a rice bed. So it's like chicken, breast, and rice, obviously. And it's like a, like a casserole almost. And you have like cream of mushroom soup and cream of chicken soup and bake that. And it's really, really tasty. My mom makes that too. It's so or something good. Something similar. It's so good. Well, I don't play in uh, in PC, so I'll say dwarves eat 
an unusual amount of mushrooms. Thick, hearty, steak-like mushrooms. Yeah. That phrasing makes me very uncomfortable. Hey, I didn't say they were sentient. (laughs) And what about us? We're all about phrasing (laughs) on this podcast. And Klaus, what is your most nostalgic food? Oh, uh, venison. Yeah. I have plenty of it all the time. The granddaddy is old, but he still bullets. So we have tons of venison. Freezer's full. Is Calvin's cheesy bread? Uh, no, I don't think he actually got any cheesy bread that time. He stood in line until the very end. And then... <sighs> so, no, I think Calvin's would probably be either... My, I was going to say that it was probably his mom's tea, as he got to share that with Melly. And, uh, but I, uh, he could just as easily be his dad's booze. Mine, uh, Michael's is probably my mom's Thanksgiving. It's turkey stuffing, gravy. It's, if I don't get it, my, my wife hears it. So, you know, it's, it's like the one thing that I won't be like, no, yours is, Yours is fine. No, I like yours. I do. It's more like no, 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 no. We have to we have to go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's good. Uh, this next one might be pretty quick, uh, but in character, what is your birthday? Your character's birthday. I've already answered this. Mine's mine is the thirteenth of the Harvestin. Mine is the twenty sixth of first seed. Mine is in the same month as Amson's. It's the fourth of first seed. Which we actually passed by on the road after we had left Hamel. It was the it was the day of that big storm where we all huddled in that tent together. That was my birthday. Well, it's technically not my birthday, but my adoption day. I'll be honest, I haven't taken a good look at that calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Ezekiel's is sometime. I didn't go, go that hard. That's that's Wait, not a question on the character question. A calendar? <laughs> oh yeah. Like we have yeah, a calendar. To it. Yeah, yeah we have an official calendar. Cool. That's that's good enough. <laughs> How about what time of year? Like what season do you think your character was born in? What's your zodiac sign? Oh my god, you guys, come on. <laughs> um, I guess Ezekiel would probably be summer. He feels like the height of nature's power kind of person. Yeah. So we missed his birthday too. Or did it happen in like the eighth, the the time gap that we <laughs> right. now have to deal with? Oh, did did Dale hear about that? Nope. Uh, oh. oh yeah, coming back from the Feywild had some problems. Hunter's probably actually Hunter's probably fine. She doesn't seem like Hunter probably much cares. It's, it's be been a while eight months. Figures it out. It's been eight months, right? Uh, Hunter so. almost certainly will never figure it out. <laughs> well, it was it was I'm first cold again already. <laughs> From her point of view, she's like, "Damn, these other people—they just age so fast." Well, it's the <laughs> the first seed. It was the first seed, and we got back in the harvesting. So I think oh, that's damn. I think that's six months. That's hard. Cool. Hunter a thousand percent does not remember her birthday. She probably has like the vaguest impression. That she was born in the fall, but then also that would be very unreliable information because she, she's living in a place that has patches of like eternal autumn. So she might just be misremembering that. <laughs> also, elves are weird. How old is Hunter? Like, how long has she just been huddled in the woods alone? <laughs> oh, Hunter, we, we talked about this class and I tried to work it out. Um, and she actually does not know how old she is. Uh, we know that she's probably between like 300 and 400 years old. She's She's an old elf, uh, and she's been out on her own probably for the last couple centuries. Cool. Here's hoping that we get to... Calvin. Yeah. Do you know roughly what season? Uh, whatever is nine months after whatever is generally considered the boinking season. So, I mean... Okay, so you're probably born in the fall. Well, yeah, (laughs) whatever. August, September... (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. hey, what's the North Hill equivalent of Valentine's Day? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they have that. <laughs> it's a garbage holiday. <laughs> There's so many people born in November. But anyways. 
Uh, this one's uh, specifically for Calvin, also from Furble Scout. This is a fun one. Uh, Calvin, please relay if there was a time when he ever doubted something his brothers told him. Uh, why, why would I doubt what my brothers say? I mean, that seems dumb. They're family. You gotta, you gotta have a level of trust. Let me tell you something. Families are like a cohesive unit. If you don't have, if you don't have trust, then who's gonna have your back? You gotta believe. You gotta believe what they say. Otherwise, you might find yourself in a, in a cot, like by some squirrel soldiers, or, you know, get, lost in a in a turtle nest it's there's there's some crap out there that you gotta know about and who else who better to teach you than your older more developed and know all know with brothers that that's that's a silly question next <laughs> uh, sage advice from calvin yep <laughs> also for calvin uh since you asked for the next question what do you enjoy smithing the most uh probably farmer equipment it's what i know help this town. It's very simple. I'm not very intricate in my designs, so I just, I try to keep things simple and functional. Farm equipment generally takes care of that. Builds in that circle square. Uh, last one for Calvin. Uh, and what's it like working for Amson's dad at the blacksmith? It's almost like working for yourself. You know, you don't really notice anybody else is there. Nice. It's just the occasional like grunt, <laughs> and someone tosses them the other hammer, and then <laughs> uh, who knows? That could have just been like <laughs> gust of wind from another region. Gorge ghosts. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Calvin is actually Amson's dad. No. Uh, next couple are from Klaus, also from Furble Scout. Uh, Klaus, you'll love this one. What's your favorite creature noise to make? In this waking nightmare. I like making growly noises. I can't make high-pitched screeching noises. I've tried and it's really bad. But I like demon and dragon voices. Those are fun. You are so good at them. Yeah. Well, my favorite. Insanely good. Are. It's honestly <laughs> offensive how good you are at that. For real. It's insane. That's why that's why we have his dragon roar in the you should, intro. You should hear me do a female voice. It's awful. It, it's just a slightly higher pitched Klaus with a little bit more of a southern accent. Okay, please do <laughs> Melly's voice. No, I can't do it. I won't I can't do that. Okay, then do Melly's voice. Do it. Do it. I don't know, I'm like Melly and I'm super sweet and you know, I just do magic. That was, that was the best I can do. That wasn't that was terrible. The spirit of it! <laughs> that wasn't terrible. That's all that matters. It's supposed to do, yeah, do Vesper. See if you can, see if you can do that shit. So, I don't know. It's sort of like a weird um, nope. Irish sort of voice. And like... <laughs> to be fair, that sounds almost exactly the same as what you did for Belly. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Nope. One female voice. <laughs> yep. That's yeah, it. Awesome. We're really it's good awesome. at dragons. It's Welsh, Welsh. It's Welsh. <laughs> It's not Welsh. It's all. It's offensive to all Welsh people. Area. I had I had one English friend tell me that she thought I had a Scottish accent. I'm like, sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> whatever you think it is. Like it's it's somewhere in the Isles. I feel like a dart and hit all three of them. Klaus, this is also one for you, and this is kind of fun because we've been talking about things that the characters have done. Uh, what is the decision you're most surprised the group has made thus far? And can I just, before you answer that, say, not the Hydra, because we've already talked about that. I love that one. That's the third. Staying to fight the Hydra. Killing Orsesis so quick, without research. And Vespers get rid of the sword magic for the Black Star Saber. Can I fucking jump in there for one sec, goddamn second? You bet you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Calvin, before he became retard paladin Calvin, he <laughs> did extensive frickin' research on the whole curse and everything, and I walked into that knowing what was going on. Calvin knew what was going on, and he, I don't know, that's, that's, he knew. He knew what had to be done, and he did it. So, thank you. You're, no, no, no you're right. You, you did, Calvin did do research. There was, um, 
And I think the synopsis was there's a very small chance if you catch it really early. Well, I think we decided we're too late. We also checked with Ezekiel's. It was not saying it was the wrong decision, but just it was, it was like, we know what we have to do. There's no hesitation. We do, we get it done. But yeah, th- those are my answers. And they were all really pivotal moments in, in the, in our game so far anyways as well. I kind of forgot about the Hydra. I'm surprised we didn't die there. That was bad. <laughs> that was insane. All of y'all didn't die there. Freaking almost natural 20 stealth rolls for, for Wink. That was insane. And I pretend to be a rock. Because I've got nothing. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. So our last few questions, they're, they're really fun ones. They're kind of just about random stuff. A few of them are from Furble Scout, one's from another uh, another person, and then just a couple of extra fun ones as we kind of wrap up our session here today. Uh, first one from Furbel Scout. Uh, which character, in the player's opinions, would win at Chubby Bunny? Okay, Ball. so Ball <laughs> has an <laughs> unfair advantage. Yeah. Just because of his physical size, he can okay. fit more marshmallows. Chubby Bunny oh. is where you put a marshmallow in your mouth, you say Chubby Bunny, and you put another marshmallow, you say Chubby Bunny, and then see who, who can put the most marshmallows and still say it. <laughs> so I feel if, if, if we, if we ignore the fact that Ball has just a completely unfair advantage over everyone else for this, I feel like that would come down to Constitution. So probably Calvin. See, I was gonna say Ellery because I think she'd cheat. Well, okay, yeah. that's a fair point. I would, yeah, I would say probably Calvin. I think he, and he's kind of got the test, so he can kind of stretch. His mouth is a little more stretched, probably. I don't know. Oh, he just called someone a stretch mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that's gross. <laughs> Next question. I mean, he stuffed his cheeks. You know what I meant. <laughs> yeah, he's really good at stuffing his cheeks with. Things. Cylindrical things. <laughs> right. Okay, that that yep. I'm yep. sure Ezekiel nope. win. <laughs> no. Gonna veto this question, but that's true. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, also from Furble Scout, uh, which character would most likely have been a Vine star if such technology and media were prevalent and accessible in Ember Short? Okay. I have I to had a- think about this a lot. Still don't have an answer. You know, I debated about this one a lot, but the first the first thought that came into my mind was Ezekiel. Anson. Uh, yeah. I thought about Anson, too, because, you know, he's a performer, but he's also a lot... He's, like, really... Am- a like, low-key. <laughs> or, like, an Instagram. He does Instagram videos of, like, nature and shit, and, like, him playing a guitar. <laughs> like, SoundCloud. Yeah, he's got like a SoundCloud and a and an Instagram. I think Calvin. Really, really my, the master. I, yeah, my Calvin was my second choice. Instinct was either Ball or Calvin, simply because if you could catch them in their incidental moments of like, yeah. or just have a series of like Ball, ask him or like ask Ball this question and see <laughs> if he understands fully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or okay, just let like that Calvin in mind. Tell his stories. Yeah, with that in mind, though, I would think it would be somebody else's vine, and Town, they yeah. would just not know about it. And it's just like, oh, oh man. I was like phone Emily's, for? Emily's girlfriend. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. That was really vague. Okay. I agree, though. <laughs> I actually thought about this for last campaign. I remember thinking, I'm like, I think Ravenwick would have had a vine. <laughs> and it would have been, like, combat. And it would have been, like, rounds of combat, because that's six seconds. And a lot of it would have been Rex and Lander, and they would have had no idea that that account existed. She, <laughs> she would have gone to her deathbed not telling her husband that <laughs> she made him famous on Vine for dumb shit that he's done in combat. She was a creep. So, I feel like it would be the Snark Squad going around and recording the yeah. Paladin Posse. I think that's exactly what it would be. We'd have a joint account. Mm-hmm. And it would probably be Ellery who suggested it. <laughs> Wait, who's the Snark Squad? Oh, Eller, Ellery, Calvin, or Ellery, um, Vesper, and Amson. <laughs> I could fair. Say- That's fair. This next one's really kind of meta to think about, but um, which classes would each of the characters pick to play if the characters played a D and D game? I honestly don't think Ezekiel would play. <laughs> <laughs> I think Vesper play a fighter because there's a lot of stuff she can. Builds. That was kind of my thoughts too. Like for Amson, he would play a combat character because he doesn't do anything in combat other than like sing songs and yell 
profanities at people. So it'd be interesting to wield a sword properly. Hunter would play a ranger because I think Hunter would want to play herself, mm-hmm. but she like she's that practical, but she doesn't have the self awareness to realize that she's a barbarian. <laughs> Ellery would absolutely play a barbarian. Get some of that aggression out. Calvin would emulate, he would just kick, create Amson as a character, and then it would just be his, his, what he thinks Amson is in the, in the thing, and he would just be, basically it would be Calvin if he were to be singing in the shower, but trying to do it in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. And Melly's the DM. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah, those are the ones from Furble Scout. Uh, so these next two are ones, uh, just from us, just cause I think it, you know, we'd all think it'd be really interesting conversational pieces. But what's a character concept you'd want to see someone else in the group play? Like, it doesn't have to be like a specific character or anything, but like, just, I want to see X person play this idea. So my answer for this one is not, it is, is actually, f- for Klaus, I would want to see how he would play a rogue. And especially, like, playing one of the smaller races. Because what I've seen so far in when we've done, like, one-shots with him as a player, he he tends to play, like, these kind of big, gruff characters a lot. And I would like to see him play someone small and sneaky. Our maniac had two levels of rogue, so it would probably be something like that. I got one for Dale. I want to see Dale play a tiefling war magic wizard. Ooh! Okay. Yes, that would be so good. Neat. I do, I do kind of avoid spellcasters a little bit, so that would be a little out of my wheelhouse. That would be dope. Except for bards. They don't count as spellcasters. They just talk a lot. They're, they're everything. No, they just talk and spell effects happen. That's what it is. I... Fina has I mean, play anything besides a rogue. Yeah. No connections <laughs> to the Thieves Guild, just like totally on the up and up. And isn't allowed to be a redhead. Can't be yeah. a redhead. <laughs> I've only had two! <laughs> Out of two. And they were very different redheads. Mm-hmm. Both wielding a crossbow. <laughs> gun, sir. Oh, gun. Shut up. <laughs> I want to see... Roger play maybe like a bard or a monk. I'm gonna steal your your the inspiration for the question. I'd like to see Roger play a monk, but I'd also like to see him play a face. I want to see him be like the charming one because he's good at it and he's you know a super sweet guy and really good at puns. So I think him being a bard would be really cool, and I I do want to see him like be a face. So to provide just a little bit of context, uh. I decided to have this question in because randomly I was like, I want to see Roger play a grappler monk because he tries to grapple all the time with Ball. And I think he'd have just a riot of a time just grappling everything and being freaking awesome at it. I I also thought of Roger as a monk as one of my possible answers for this question. So I think we're all agreed he has to play a monk. I think he knows some jujitsu, so that would fit. I'm kind of cheating because Michael has mentioned this character concept that I would love to see come to fruition was that magical girl monk that you almost played for our high level one one shot that I think would be amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Please do that at some point. Uh, I'm waiting for it. Whatever time it happens, I want that because I'm sure it will be that shade insane. And I, I want her to come to life at some point. I was going to have a list of special attacks. And it just, like, basically, Calvin's kind of stealing it a little bit with his stuff. But his moonbeam love aura, or whatever. I don't know. That was going to that was gonna come out a lot. Perfect. <laughs> I could see Calvin as a magical girl. Yeah, so can I, which is super <laughs> sad. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my god if that was what happened every time he took that like sacrifice vow he has like a little dance and like spins around <laughs> there's oh. sparkles 
Utada Hikaru is playing in the background. A crown <laughs> appears on his head. Little bows. He makes a pose. <laughs> is that everyone's answer? I will ask next question. Michael, since... did you answer for this one? Oh no. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. Uh, shucks, howdy. Maybe he wants to see me play a character he doesn't hate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that a class? Is there a class for that? That's a concept. Can you take it? No. It sure is a concept. Just play like a squire to whatever Michael plays next. <laughs> yeah, basically play what you were supposed to play when we were doing the first Monster Hunters, where you're supposed to be infatuated with... Uh, oh, right, right. I'll just bring back hell? Steve. You like Steve. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just bring Steve back. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, since <laughs> since Alex is dying, our next question is: uh, What is your favorite tabletop RPG system besides Fifth Edition D and D? There's a lot. There's so many. I think it's easiest for me, maybe because I'm so new to tabletop RPGs. I haven't played many. Uh, so, Monster of the Week, which we are playing on Tuesdays. I adore that system. It's it's so much fun. Uh, yeah, yeah that's going to be my answer, too. Yeah, yeah. third in. But yeah, I mean, really because fun. we're actively playing a campaign, <laughs> really I really nice. enjoy running in that system. I've been looking at the other uh, Powered by the Apocalypse systems to see how they work. Some of them, I think, are less well implemented, but there's a lot of different variations that they've come up with with this that kind of system, so I think it has that flexibility, and it's also not as number crunchy um and my dm style tends to i don't know i do a little bit better in kind of freeform improv which that really plays into so yeah i like the the monster of the week system and the powered by the apocalypse things yeah no in terms of um other rpgs i'm really drawn to other games that kind of try to pin down rpgs outside of fantasy so i really like um the fate system for that i think the the idea of taking high concepts for characters and using that to run an entire game is kind of genius. Um, and then also the the new Kids on Bikes. Uh, I haven't played the whole game a whole lot recently, but uh, the character creation system, the world generation system in that is just so much fun and kind of almost a game in itself, which I really like. I really oh, want to play that one. Just playing off what you just said about the the character creation, I think that's why that's probably the biggest reason why Monster Hunter Monster of the Week is such a big thing for us. Creating yeah. creating all our characters and and finding the way they connect with each other is is a lot of fun. Oh hell yeah! And then also, I mean, if you've got new players, finding a way to make making characters a blast is so important because otherwise you're like, here's a piece of paper and a lot of maths. I swear, at some point, it's gonna get good. Yeah, and I I like being able to create the characters together to a certain extent. Even if you come in with a concept for the character, you're still you're developing them as a group so that they all mesh well and fit together. And I like I, I just really like how everyone in the group. I think we could implement something similar for future D and D stuff or for future other systems. But I love that like no matter what in Monster of the Week it works really well that you have to have a connection to everyone else in the group. And so you have to figure out, okay, what, and that could give you like a whole nother back part of your backstory, like Charlie and, uh, Mikael. That whole thing became like a really big moment of just. All it the- also gave me a lot to work with because I tend to build my story very character focused. And when you all have already figured out like how you were in relation, I got to build off of that and like explore, well, this character has a connection to this thing and there's this mystery in this other character that kind of tied together. I don't know. It somehow all managed to come together um, in ways that I'm not allowed to talk about because you're still playing the campaign, but it's kind of beautiful how everyone's, the choices that you picked ended up fitting and actually letting my story work because I had an idea of where I wanted it to go. And I was like, I don't know how everything happened. And then you figured out how your characters were in relation to each other. And I was like, Oh, that's how it's all working out. And it somehow made it even more, like, it wasn't hard to write you into the storyline I had planned because you gave me all of the ideas I needed to make the storyline work. And I have to say again, the way you've weaved it together is just brilliant. 
Yeah, we'll see I... if I can, I can stick the landing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, from where we are suspended in the air right now, I'm like, I want to see it go forth. And I really, we're playing this week, right? <laughs> we'll see. Please? <laughs> <laughs> I, anyway, next question. <laughs> I, I, I would love to do another one of these. Uh, after we're done with Monsters of the Week, and then just grill George on all the questions on a whole bunch of stuff, and just talk about Monsters of the Week. Like it's not specifically yeah. geared towards like D and D, like like Bonfire Fables is right now. But I think that'd be a lot of fun talking about Monsters of the Week and the story that that we that we all told together, and what George was doing behind the scenes and all that kind of stuff. I think that would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, my answer, I'm obligated to say Pathfinder because I run a Pathfinder group and some of them <laughs> listen to this show. Um, but actually it is probably my favorite system outside of D&D. In, and the reason, like, I love Monsters of the Week and I love how flexible it is and I love the system and everything like that. Uh, and just how freeform it is. But for me, Pathfinder provides this le- level of rigidity, like, yet com- customization that 5e doesn't have as much like with 5e you can kind of almost do just about anything you know and you'll have a decent character but with pathfinder there are hundreds of thousands probably millions of combinations that you can do and yeah some of them are absolute crap but just the amount of different things that you can do in in pathfinder and just the the versatility of everything i like it yeah, Ezekiel actually started at, I was building something for Pathfinder, and I had no idea, but the amount of customization and archetypes, like, I built a character that was fun to play, and just simply from the number of options, like, it gave me who that character was, because, like, you could get so specific as to, like, what individual skills, and how well he's trained in each of these, and, like, sub these abilities so that, yes, he's going to be an Inquisitor, in Pathfinder, but he was also taking like a ranger archetype kind of thing, and it translated. It, he was he's very different than he would have ended up in that campaign. But like Pathfinder has really, if you're willing to dive through the thousands of options, a lot of ways to like make a very very specific character, which I think is fun. Yeah, exactly. Like if you want to build a very specific character build, you can do it in Pathfinder. Because there are that many options and that many spells and that many extra books and expansions and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's probably, and that and I like, um, I don't know. I, I'm probably in a, in a rare, uh, group of people that actually thoroughly enjoy 3.5 and all of its issues. <laughs> no, I think there's a, a lot of people that like 3.5, aren't there? I mean, I at least, I remember when, 4E came out, and everybody was pissed off at it, so... Well, they were, they're like, all oh, divided very different to two different groups. They they're, were segregated early, yeah. so that they could never come to to war ever again. The The reason why I say that 3.5 in Pathfinder is less popular now is because 5E came out, and I do think that 5E is objectively a better system in terms of how it flows and how it plays, and uh, how it balances really well both role play and combat. I think in general it is overall a better system, but I think I just love Pathfinder. Uh, if if I can, I would like to uh, submit uh all out of bubblegum as my particular favorite. I'm more of a party gamer myself. I uh I like to play board games and stuff for giggles uh, when people get together. And all out of bubblegum is super, super easy, and it can just go anywhere. I I've heard some really goofy stuff out of basically the most mundane tasks, and it just it can if if you have a, a very creative group, just stuff can get nuts. It's super easy. You either you either kick ass or or you bubblegum, and it's you just roll one. It's super easy, and it, it, there's nothing to really explain, and you get a bunch of bubblegum. What what's there to what's what could be that? That's one I've definitely wanted to play. I uh, I do want to take a moment to mention it's not my favorite system, but it's uh the first 
tabletop RPG that I ever played before the D&D game that I played with Swan and a couple other people. I played this three-person game called Downfall, and it's not very well known at all. But the way it works is that you collaboratively build a civilization. You create some characters. You switch between the characters. So everybody has an opportunity to play each of these central characters. And you watch as their society collapses, which is why it's called Downfall. So you get to create something and then destroy it. And it's a lot of fun. My my game of that included bees that were basically ruling over the remaining human population after an ecological disaster. And it was just fantastic. Mine, it's not a favorite again. I definitely think Monster of the Week has been, has captured my heart outside of uh, D&D. But I have a soft spot for Fantasy Age because that's where I really started. And I've rambled about this, but not, I don't think, on uh, on air. I love the way they do armor in that game, because you have two different scores. You have your defense score, which is based on your dexterity and like how hard you are to hit. And then you have your armor score, which is, I think, on a scale of like one to five, usually, for player characters. And your defense score, so if you beat your defense score then you get hit. So say your armor score is a 3, and someone rolls a 5 for damage, because it's all 3d6, it's the whole game. And so someone gets a 5 for damage, um, but your armor score is 3, so you only take 2 damage, because your armor is protecting you from that blow. And I'm like, I really like that, you know, even if you have like this big tanky muscle wizard, and someone just hits you real good, you still, you know, you just take all of the damage because it's a super elegant system, yeah. I yeah. also that really love the stunt system they have. I love the stunt system. The only thing I would complain about is the movement, because they consider your movement to be a minor action. So it's basically you have to use your whole bonus action to move, which is the only thing that I'm like, kind of garbage. But other than that, like, it's it's such a great system with a lot of the different stuff. Like, yeah, the stunts are really cool. You have combat stunts, you have role play stunts, you have exploration stunts, and so I actually have my monster that I can show at least visually here. You have three D6, and two of them are one color, and your third D6 is another color. And any time you roll doubles on two of your dice, whatever is displayed on your odd-colored dice, you get stunt points. And so you can look at this basically this menu of stunts, and it allows you to choose. You can like basically buy different moves that like embellish what you're doing. You can do more damage, you can... It's kind of like in Monster of the Week when you roll high enough that you get to, like, pick an extra effect for your move. But they have all these different ones that are, like, really cool, and it really adds the flavor to the, the situation. Klaus, did you state one? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Monster of the Week is probably my second. So, we only have a couple questions left. Uh, the last one, the last, like, official question is one for Dale, because you are uh, super That's into me. like mythology and folklore and stuff like this. I am. Yeah, it's kind of like your thing. Just um, a bit. <laughs> just a bit. So this one person I know, uh, and she listens every now and then. Uh, Am Paulson. She asks, um, and "This is about folklore, and anybody can talk about it if they want to." Uh, why does it seem Western stories and folklore are so much more prominent in common knowledge than Eastern or African folklore? And this is asked from a North American perspective. And the or the example that she gives is Lion King comparing it to Shakespeare plays versus the ep- the Epic of Sundiata, which is a uh, West African legend. Right. Well, um, I suppose I should start off by saying, hey, fair warning, I'm not actually an expert. Although, actually, I have given a couple of university guest lectures on mythology now, so maybe at some point I have to stop saying that. But um, just, you know, it, it take me with some salt, but not that much salt. But uh, I would say I'd venture that it comes from a couple of things. So, first of all, it's important to recognize that the perception of prominence of a specific kind of um, story being told is it is skewed by context. So, um, you know, in, in an African country, you're going to be more likely to, to hear 
the African folklore story that matches up with the Lion King than you would be in a Western country. Um, so, for example, I, I grew up out in the middle of what well, I grew up in a rural town in Australia uh, called Nara. It's got high indigenous population, things like that. So, if I'm talking to someone that I grew up with and I reference Greek mythology, people are much less likely to understand that than if I was to bring up uh, specifically like the dream time story of how the Waratah got colored red or, you know, um, the story of why black cockatoos are called Nara. You know, I, we, we kind of have this shared cultural context that makes one of those stories more prominent in our consciousness than the other stories are. Um, and so we get this, this Western context and this Western consciousness of what the important stories are that we tell. And I mean, some, some folklore from other places does seep in from global contexts. So you've got things like, um, in North America, you've got stories like the Br'er Rabbit, um, which are kind of a mishmash of a, of a bunch of things. There's, it's a mixture of stories of a Nancy, who's the trickster spider figure from a lot of, uh, African cultures. And you, that kind of was brought over with, with the slaves. And then that meshes with different First Nations stories that have rabbit trickster figures. And it all kind of gets boiled up together and ends up being told in a completely new context and becoming its own story. So you get these cycles that happen over and over again and they get reformed and reimagined. And so by the time we see them in a Western context, they just look different. There, I mean, there are things like, there definitely is um, something that allows Western traditions to overpower a lot of global traditions. Um, so, like, a good example of that is the Greek zodiac. We we all are familiar, you know, with the Leo, Gemini, blah, blah, blah. We have all these, but it's, it's absurd to think that other cultures didn't look at the stars and also paint stories with them. Um, or every culture has their stories and their constellations, but the ones that we tend to focus on, uh, at the very least in the West, are these Greek uh, or Roman sort of constellations and zodiacs. So, I mean, really the simple answer is that the West invaded the whole planet <laughs> at various points. And uh, so when we encountered other cultures, we, at best, we valued written stories over oral traditions, which meant that um, a lot of cultures which didn't write their things down, uh, they kind of disappeared. That's the best version of events. That's why we still have uh, a lot of information on things like Egyptian mythology, because they actually were one of the earliest cultures that wrote stuff down. Um, and so we didn't completely get rid of it. But there is the other end of the spectrum where we did actively seek and destroy uh, a bunch of the cultural relics from these places. And it's interesting, it's interesting that that actually, it did happen to England. Back in the day, uh, Tolkien very famously was upset that England's mythology was lost. And so he set out to recreate it when he made Lord of the Rings. Um, and we have things like, you know, the Arthurian legends that were created much later on. We don't have the sort of early stories as much. Um, I mean, we do have some. Some of them survived. The Welsh were very hardy people. But so that kind of gets tied in as well with uh, the Western canon and Western mythology was sort of carried through it. It carried a lucky wave, I guess. Uh, it, it caught this wave of religion as it moved and changed across the planet. So we start sort of with Greece and the Greek stories, which then uh, they were overrun by the Romans who took over and they took a lot of those stories and just plastered different names on them. And then after that, the, the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire, got tied up with Christianity. The Romans took over the the British Isles and so then they wiped out the stories that were there and replaced them with these other stories which was now a combination of their Roman Greek uh, sort of historical tradition combined with the Christian tradition at the same time and so then that all kind of comes in together and then by the time we get to Shakespeare or things in the literary canon uh, by then the West which was this amalgamation of other cultures coming together by the time they're taking over the world like this like literally going around taking over the world, uh, they they have this weird combination of um, what stories they think is the most important set of stories to tell. Um, and so we, we actually, it's, it's a technical term, it's the literary canon, um, and that's kind of the, the stories that everyone goes, this is the important stuff for people who are intellectual and well-learned to know. Um, but the tricky thing with that is that it gets decided by whoever's in power. So we had white men from the West in power for a really long time, and so they decided that the important stories were the stories that 
white men told. Um, and very, very slowly it's changing, but that is basically kind of how it all comes together to, to make, to make us go, oh yes, the Lion King, that's definitely Hamlet and no other stories that maybe contain lions, you know? Um, so yeah, it's all very complica- complicated and interesting and yeah. But yeah, it's kind of like a, a mixture of, <laughs> We're applauding behind the music microphones. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, basically, it, it's a mixture of, uh, historical context and how history just kind of happened. And then, mm. based off of the cultural context that we now live in, because of that couple, several millennia of history and how yeah. it, both history and folklore evolved through that. Yeah. And, and I mean, all, all high culture texts were once pop culture texts you know so these were all popular stories at one stage um and so we kind of yeah the the world is made up of the stories that we tell we cannot understand the world the world cannot exist around us without us framing it in a story and that's why that's why you know tv shows and the stories that we tell now even though they come in the context of like oh riverdale that's such dramatic trash and it is uh but also it's important to recognize what kind of messages we're sending in those stories because of this huge history of that changing how we think about the world. Hey, you never know. Some of the stories that we might have that are like over a thousand years old, they might have been seen as dramatic trash back then. <laughs> well, what's yeah, exactly. Is I, I read a theory once where it's talking about like a lot of our perception of especially like the Middle Ages and such is we look at, you know, Shakespeare's work like Romeo and Juliet and how she was 13 and blah, 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 blah. And all of that was actually very unusual. People did not get married that young. If you actually look at the census records and the marriage records of the time, people were getting married when they were like in their 20s, like we did now. It was very weird and kind of skeevy to have married a child. But because it was such a dramatic plot point, that's what was being used in the story. And that his story has survived for so long that that's now what we imagine it was like back then. But that's so wildly skewed. It's like someone yeah, said, it's like if you take supernatural and imagine that that's what the world is like nowadays and yeah. and with the idea of, of like marrying at a very young age or or with dying at a very early age well with, with the the mortality stuff that has more to do with looking at averages and and the fact that a lot of very young children died early but then if you survived childhood you'd probably yeah. have a similar lifespan to today. It's completely skewed, yeah. And and that's and another with, example of how the written stuff ends up overpowering um, the spoken stuff because we just go, oh, well, this is written down. It's evidence, evidence of what it was like. But And, and we say things like, oh, well, Shakespeare invented the word elbow. It's like, no, Shakespeare didn't invent the word, the word elbow. Otherwise, no one would understand that scene. He was the one who wrote it, He was, you know? it, he was yeah. just the first one to write it down. Exactly. It's like we, we skew our perceptions based on what was written and who it was written by. And with, like, marriage age, a lot of that is that, well, if you were nobility or royalty, you were likely to marry younger for political purposes. But if you didn't have that hanging over your head, then you are much more likely to, to marry at the at the earliest late teens. And another thing, too, I was reading at that same post, I think it was, like, talking about how, like, you know, marrying younger women to, like, older men was seen as gross and skeevy. And the reason it was used so often, again, in stories was because it was a dramatic element. It was gross element. and skeevy. It was gross and skeevy, and it was meant to be portrayed that way. So the way of, like, if we had, I don't know, if we had a bunch of characters like, in George's campaign, the I'm just thinking Arthur Wood. If we had a bunch of characters like that, people would go, oh, well, that was the norm. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, kind of, but not, not really. It, it's definitely someone painted to be the villain, someone painted to be gross and we would understand that but because it was being used repeatedly because there was no such thing as plagiarism and copyright back then you would take these dramatic elements again and again and again that were meant to be unusual and dramatic and it became something in multiple stories and now we look back at that and go oh, that must have been what it was like and it really was it's a trope it's like getting caught in tropes quicks- exactly in quicksand you know it's something that we yeah. use to tell stories because it's fun and edgy mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess the the downside of and looking at stories that are so old is we often forget the cultural context in which they came from in the first place. And so, you know, it, it's like that case where maybe, you know, we think everybody, like, 
got married super young because everybody died in their 40s in the Middle Ages. But that's not the case. That's right. This was fun. I like I like talking about these things. Good question. <laughs> yeah. My I, TED talk. Thank you, A.M. Like Paulson. Yeah. Uh, Shall we? So we're we're a little bit over time, but but that's fine. We actually answered just about all the questions, just the ones that Roger couldn't answer because he wasn't here. So I I just want to take a quick moment to thank all the listeners for submitting questions, and I want to thank everybody who is not a listener who's part of the podcast who thought of questions, and thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Dale, for accepting the invitation to come back and hang out with us for some time. Thank uh, you for having me again. <laughs> thank you to our lovely DM, Klaus, for making this absolutely amazing D&D &D yeah. game that we can ha hang out and have fun in. And thank you for all of the players who make such wonderful and amazing characters that we get to interact with almost every week. For the last little bit, um, I just want to open up the floor to... If anybody's working on anything that the public should be excited about, this is your time to go full sellout mode and just be like, hey, I'm working on this. You should be excited about it. I mean, I've got two fanfics in the works, so that's about it. <laughs> eventually, I'm going to post a Skyrim fanfic, and eventually I'll post an Arcana fanfic, but whatever. I don't know. It's not quite for the public. I might do a PDF of it at some point once I maybe get actual official art instead of just stuff I found on Google, but I could tell you guys what I made for Christmas that didn't get done in time since it will be, I don't know how long until it's finished. That could be nice to release as a PDF. Uh, it is the Bronze Scales cookbook. So there is a section... That is the cutest. There is a section, um, Alchem Mixology, which is different mixed drinks because um, I know some of us drink more than we perhaps partake of food. <laughs> so... Uh, there is a drink for each character, um, and for Klaus, and I think I have one for an NPC. Um, I try to have like a couple NPCs in each section. There's also a drink for Hunter, um, and a dessert for Hunter. What? Mm hmm So there is a, the Alchemixology section. There is a, a tavern food section, which is like small plates and like sides. I think the NPC in that one, I don't remember now. Uh, there's a main course, and then there's the, uh, desserts, which has the most of things and stuff. So, okay, I'm I am super excited for this. <laughs> yeah, so I have I have most of it. I can kind of give a preview. Um, hang on, if I can find my thing that has all of my stuff. Uh, the only one I don't have. Um, I'm still working out two of the main courses. I need Calvin's and Nellie's. Still working on that. I should have a. Hang on a moment. Uh, something that has all of my table contents, or maybe not. Okay, cool. I don't have that up here, but I can send you guys the table contents yeah, later. Yeah. And uh, I have, yeah. That's why I've been asking everyone weird questions of like Calvin that Drink is, is amazing. Um, yeah, Calvin Drink actually is habanero tequila cocktail. Clouds is an old fashioned. Uh, that's his favorite. Ellery's is a dark and stormy. Amson's is sangria. Ezekiel's is a uh, Shirley Temple. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Vespers is this really weird thing I found that like you can make smoke. Did you know you can make you can smoke ice? You can make smoked ice. You make smoke in a smoker. Yeah, you can smoke. Yeah. I've had several smoked cocktails too. Yeah. So I found a way to make smoked ice, and I was like, "Cool, I'll do that." Um, Hunter's is wassail, her drink, and her dessert is yeah. um, there's these things in this like cookbook my mom has called uh, Snow on the Mountain Cookies. Oh my god! So they look like mountains with like snow on it because they've got frosting. So this is amazing. <laughs> so that's the thing. I might make a PDF of it eventually. I'd need to get new art. I literally just found stuff on Google. Um, but the plan for Christmas that fell through because I was sick with food poisoning and just there was stuff. I was gonna print it out and bind it and send it to y'all. But I will still probably do that. But uh, it'll be a while. <laughs> well, I'm working on something that I can't tell you about. And I may be working on something if I can find time to do it and figure out how videos work. I like D and D tip stuff, but I a lot of stuff I read are longer videos. So I'm thinking about making some really small condensed like bullet point stuff to form into cheat sheets. We'll see. We'll see. And where can we find all of your homebrew stuff? That's all on D and D skills. Yeah. Yeah, I have a 
four classes, four or five classes on DM's Guild, one race, and a childhood start, which is what the bronze skills did. So all that's on DM's Guild. Uh, Klaus White, search that. And I believe you have a link to your DM's Guild page on your Twitter. I do. I have a Twitter, and I use it sometimes. I like that you started yours with the phrase, I'm doing something that I can't tell you about, which is just you're it's such a I'm true so internet personality. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think. By the time that this will have come out, uh, the finale of Wolfgang will have aired, which is my uh, scripted web series about a little gang of werewolves. Um, so, mm. hey, you can go and watch it all from the beginning, and it will all be there. That's exciting. The finale? <laughs> yep. It's oh. done. We're done. It's a year in the life. I oh. started just before New Year's last year, and so the final full moon will be Christmas Eve, or the day before Christmas Eve. I, time zones are hard, y'all. Um, but, yeah, so that's on Monarch's Factory, which is my YouTube channel where I do other things as well. The two things that I'm hoping to work on by the time this episode is aired and posted is I'm going to do, hopefully over the holiday break here, is I want to record a couple covers of a couple songs because I'm also an acting nerd. And uh, one of my fantasy roles that I want to hopefully do one day is Javert from Les Mis. So I'm going to... Gosh, yes. I know, right? And so I'm going to try to cover both Stars and um, The Confrontation from Les Mis. Uh, and then I'll post that if they are good. And I'm also working on a homebrew document. Uh, it's a really large project that I've been working on for the past few months. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but it is called Woodland Races, and there are 12 races, and I'm working on that, and hopefully that'll be done by the time this episode airs. I'll be posting all of that stuff on Stories by Amson on both Twitter and Tumblr, and then the homebrew will be on DM's Guild. Woodland Races, Amson Spirit Scribe. And oh Fino, why are you so extra? <laughs> you know me. I just am. Too much. She made us candles last year, scented, yeah. unthemed by our characters. She's been taking those. Since they, since because they're... I love you and I like to make cool things. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to officially wrap up this uh, second ever episode of The Bonfire Fables. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for everybody who's uh, listening and or listened. And thank you for all the people who submitted questions. We are more than happy to do this again sometime. We enjoy talking and hanging out about games and stuff like that. And so if you have any questions, feel free to submit them at any other time. And we'll get around to it next time we decide to do a Bonfire Fables. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And we'll hope to see you again next time, either in Back to the Story or Bonfire Fables or whatever we're working on next time. So, peace. Thank you for listening to this episode of Back to the Story. For notifications when an episode goes live, you can find us on Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, or TuneIn. Download the app and subscribe or favorite us there. We also have a YouTube channel called Back to the Story, an actual play podcast. If you'd like to contact us, you can tweet us at back to underscore the story. If you can't fit it into 280 characters, you can email us at thebonfirefables at gmail.com. And if you'd like further information about the campaign, the player characters, or behind-the-scenes sneak peeks, follow us on either Twitter or our Tumblr website. Lastly, if you'd like to support the show, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash back to the story.